everyone, welcome back to my channel. Um, today I have a special guest that I'm introducing. This is Dr. Miller, he's also my dad. Uh, this video is gonna go up on YouTube but also on my Instagram channel, so if you're watching on IGTV, um, then this is not welcome to my channel, but welcome to my Instagram page. Happy to have you here. Um, today I wanted to bring Dr. Miller onto the channel to share a little bit about nitric oxide. The reason that I wanted him to come on was because I think that uh, nitric oxide as a therapeutic is going to be a popular topic of discussion among the medical community in the next coming weeks, coming months, and so I thought it would be great to sit down with someone who's been studying nitric oxide for essentially his entire life and to share a little bit of information with you guys. So. Some of you already know that I did some research before medical school and also during medical school in relation to nitric oxide as an antimicrobial, as a therapeutic drug. And so I presented my abstract that I worked on with you and your team at the American Thoracic Society conference last May. Um, so you may have seen me talk about that. If you haven't, then this is going to be your first introduction. So it's a very interesting topic and I'm excited to share today. So before we get started. I just want to put it out there that there is the reason I wanted to talk about this is because there's current there are currently some studies looking at the use of uh, inhaled nitric oxide as, as well as topical nitric oxide um, as a therapeutic to treat the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so there has been a lot of research uh, about this drug as a therapeutic over the past couple of decades leading up to this point. And so I wanted to kind of show the progression of that and. Give, give some people an idea of how this all came to be. So, uh, without further ado, would you like to share a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself to everyone who's watching? Sure, thanks Casey. Um, <clears throat> my name is Chris Miller, and um, I was originally a respiratory therapist, um, practiced that for 15 years, and then I went back to do my PhD in experimental medicine, and um, I have uh, been doing that for the last couple of decades. And I uh, currently am the assistant professor um, in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in the Division of Respiratory Medicine and affiliated with infectious diseases. I'm also, full disclosure, I am the co-founder of Nova Terrace, which is pursuing pr um, uh, pressurized gaseous nitric oxide. And I am the co-founder of Sanotize, which is a topical liquid nitric oxide um, donor. Good. Important to do the disclosures. Thank you. Um, so just, I wanted to jump right into it and start off by asking you to explain uh, what is nitric oxide just in general for the layperson and also for the healthcare professionals who are wondering about that. Great. Okay. So first of all, nitric or nitric is not nitrous oxide, not the laughing gas. So nitric oxide is a nanomolecule and we didn't even know it existed till basically um, 1987. And thanks to three Nobel laureates, the discovery of nitric oxide, Dr. Murad, who looked at the chemistry, Dr. Furchgott, who looked at the nitric oxide as a smooth muscle regulator and called it endothelium-derived relaxing factor. And then in Ignero, Dr. Ignero in 1987 identified that that smooth muscle relaxant or that endothelium-derived relaxing factor was indeed the molecule, the teeny tiny molecule nitric oxide and that it's in our bodies in the endothelial lining or the inner lining of our blood vessels that cause relaxation. Good summary. Um, okay, so with all of that, um, how did you get involved in studying nitric oxide? Because it was all a long time ago, so explain that to us a little bit about your background. Sure, of course I was a respiratory therapist at the time and I was working in Saudi Arabia and in a great respiratory department there and I was doing some literature search because I wanted to go back and do get my PhD and I came across this article by Hig, Dr. Higginbotham that was out of England. He was doing some uh, animal research looking at nitric oxide as a selective pulmonary vasodilator in an animal model and I became very excited that a gaseous nitric oxide, being a respiratory therapist, was going to be involved in, in, in medicine and I read all I could about it and so since I didn't know much I decided to go back and do a lit search which there wasn't very much to read but what I did is I collated together everything I could know about nitric oxide as a smooth muscle relaxant and I put it together and I published that in October 1992 in Respiratory Care magazine. 
pretty cool. I actually have a quote that I took from you from one of your papers from a long time ago. I just realized that I don't have it. So one second, I'm gonna go grab that. Okay, so this is from 1992, the year that I was born. And you said, it is hard to imagine a toxic air pollutant juxtaposed with important medical gases like oxygen and nitrous oxide. Yet the possible use of inhaled nitric oxide as a therapeutic gas may well be one of the more important findings in pulmonary medicine. If this proves to be the case, a revolution in medical gas therapy may result. Respiratory care practitioners already knowledgeable of um, and adept at gas delivery would be expected to play an important role should this new therapy come to fruition. So the reason that I got that quote and wanted to share that with everyone uh, was because you were a respiratory therapist. And so I want I wanted you to kind of explain how you started as an RT and how you got to where you are now and got involved with all, all this. Okay, just a little bit. So um, as a respiratory therapist, as I mentioned earlier, I was very excited. But when I started looking into it, how to maybe help the neonatologist, well, when they read my article and we put our heads together, Dr. Neil Finer out of Edmonton, Alberta, he wanted to do an animal model, but we had no way of delivering nitric oxide. It was a poisonous gas, how to get it. There were skull and crossbones on the, on the cylinders. And... Um, and we had no way really to, to measure it other than a big chemiluminescent analyzer. So I got together a team, my brother and a few people, and I was a respiratory therapist. We put together, we got a, a National Research Council grant, and we built an analyzer called the, we called it the Pulmonox Analyzer. And it measured nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen together. And then we had a, a, what we call the, the tin box that measured and delivered nitric oxide based on the, the, the flow of the, of the ventilator. We put that all together, worked with Neil Feiner, and he did the animal models, and we were very excited. Turns out that we worked with a great family called the Whole Family out of Edmonton, and they gave us some funding, and we put together, and we made all these analyzers, and we were in the grassroots nitric oxide um, arena at the time, and uh, we went forward from there in the development of the two of the first three approved uh, 510K um, devices for the delivering nitric oxide and analyzing it in the early days of nitric before it was approved as a selective pulmonary basal dilator for treating persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Right, so that's what I was getting to. I wanted you to talk about that because when I was in medical school, basic sciences, studying uh, different drugs, pulmonary drugs, um, that was the first time I came across nitric oxide in medical school and the only time, the only thing that I really learned about it was that it was used, it could be used as a therapeutic for neo neonates with pulmonary hypertension. I'm not sure if um, there's anything else in the first aid books now uh, about nitric oxide as a therapeutic, but at the time I think there, there wasn't much out there. Um, and so that I think is the case for a lot of medical um, students who are watching and also providers who may not know anything about this as a therapeutic up until this point. So that was all approved in the 90s to treat neonates with pulmonary hypertension. So I kind of wanted to know, you know, since then you've, you and other people have studied nitric oxide in vitro, in the petri dish, um, in animal studies and in human studies. So how did all of that uh, get started? Yeah, so um, one day while I was in the lab, I, when I was starting my PhD and working um, with the company I was making the analyzers, Pulmonox, I put a tube in my nose because I wanted to look at nitric oxide measurement coming from the lungs. And as I pulled the tube out, I realized when it came into my nose, there was these high levels of nitric oxide and it would mess up the, the analytical machine. And, and then I went into the literature and I looked in the, I think it was uh, Dr. Gustav out of, uh, Gustafsson out of Sweden. He had, was looking at end tidal nitric oxide for asthma, and they had seen those artifacts too. And then I, um, in the literature, found out that a disease that, um, what's the name of the disease? I was get wrong, Cartag Car Cartagoner. Cartagoner syndrome, um, that is a sinus blockage kind of uh, ciliary uh, um, blocking. It has hardly any nitric oxide being produced. So I put sort of things together. A lot of other people have done some great work. Um, Nathan, um, Carl Nathan, they had looked at nitric oxide being produced in the cells of the body as an antimicrobial, sort of put all this together from a therapeutic perspective and said, wow, you know, if nitric oxide is so important in the upper airway and the sinuses, 
Well, maybe there's a therapeutic use of it. Like we, we use, we, we humidify gas on ventilators. Maybe you have to replace nitric oxide when you intubate a person. And so that's kind of started my passion on looking at nitric oxide as a therapeutic gas as an antimicrobial. And so I switched my whole PhD from um, being a, uh, looking for hypertension in, in adults, boring. I went into this whole new field of uh, nitric oxide as antimicrobial, did my PhD as uh, gaseous nitric oxide as a bacterial cytal agent. Right. And so, so for cartagoners, you were saying that, you know, to, or what you had read in the literature is that there was a lot less nitric oxide being produced in the airway, upper airway in cartagoners patients. And so you wondered if that was leading to infection, right? Right. Okay. Exactly. Just clarifying. Um, okay. So since that time, since you got involved with all of that, uh, you and many other researchers have since determined that nitric oxide is an antimicrobial. It's an antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasite. And so when I was, because I was doing some research with your team as well, I had to um, read a bunch of the papers and I was reading about the mechanisms of action of nitric oxide. And I say mechanisms plural because I quickly realized that there are a million different ways that nitric oxide acts on um, the human cell and also microbial cells. And so I think something that would be important for people to understand. Um, I don't expect you to explain every single mechanism of action in the cell, but how is it uh, cytocidal without, uh, and still be safe for humans? How does it uh, kill bacteria without uh, killing host cells as well? Well, that's a great question. And so I think the simplest way is to use the word nitric oxide nitrosylates proteins. And so all that means is nitric oxide reacts with many sites and it basically replaces molecules um, with nitric oxide. Since nitric oxide is a free radical, it, it reacts with a lot of things. So nitric oxide is a nanomolecule, and it, because it's a nanomolecule, it is able to pass through membranes, cell membranes, super easy. Um, it's lip lipophilic also, so that also enhances getting into the cytosol of the shit cell. Once you have um, nitric oxide by itself, because it's a free radical, it will nitrosylate um, DNA, it will react with enzymes, get rid of the respiratory function, it uh, reacts with, uh, with iron in the cell. And so I always liken it to like, it's like throwing a grenade in the cell. When someone says, what's the single, and this is what makes nitric so different, and what's the single mechanism of action? It's like, well, there's a ton of mechanism of action, but basically it's nitrosylation, goes in, basically kills the cell. Now, why is it safe in human cells? Because not surprising, our bodies produce nitric oxide. And so I, we have developed uh, in our cells an ability to detoxify. And that is a glutathione mechanism. And uh, one of my um, professors, uh, Dr. Abge, he came up and worked with a group and they came up with in, in, in tuberculosis, mycothiol. And so I did some research in that area with them to look at the, that mechanism of when that's gone, then it's toxic to the cell. So we were able to show that if you don't have that in your cell, it kills the cell. And so, because our bodies have a lot of glutathione, our bodies have a, the ability to detoxify nitrosative stress, whereas microbes don't have that ability, and so it kills them. Mm -hmm. Which then also contributes to uh, reduced anti or antibiotic resistance, or drug resistance. Oh, right? that's, a, that's a great question. So because of that broad cytotoxic effect, the the microbe, say the bacteria, has really no ability, and Colasanti and some others have published, so that it's unlikely that nitric oxide will induce um, drug resistance or, or tolerance to nitric oxide. And that's we've shown that in some of our papers as well as others. So it's quite exciting to have an antimicrobial yeah. that may not be drug resistant. So that's exciting. Definitely.